The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. Uh, this is an exciting time, and I wanted to make sure this is on video before I began even. I'm really encouraging people that are taking road trips to come for our Thursday night and Tuesday night. Um, I'm encouraging them to listen to Jennifer's message. Uh, eight, what was that, August 20, August 28th, YouTube. Double check that because it will save a lot of explanation and it can uh, uh, accelerate our ability to get ministry. Now, here's the plan the Lord gave me, uh, and I want to encourage people to recognize the difference. We have three services a week now, and the Sunday service is pretty standard. It's what we're hearing the Lord speak to us as a group and to the church at large. But Tuesdays, uh, Charismatics would know it as soaking, but it's far more than that. What it is is it's a training time to cultivate your spiritual senses, seeing, hearing, touching, and then sharing that and then seeing in a corporate setting what, what God is uh, saying through us. And that has matured to such a point that that used to be just us because it was about us. But once I saw that kind of a level of one accord and the maturity that's here, I says, God says, you need to model it. So we're opening up Tuesday nights to other people come and observe because it's something you probably haven't seen before. It takes, it takes relationship, not a crowd. It takes relationship to produce the kind of corporate atmosphere that we're seeing on Tuesdays. So some would call it soaking, but in reality it's soaking with specificity because <laughs> uh, hearing, seeing, and touching the atmosphere, one of the things that's most difficult even for a church is to get into the presence of God and quiet your noisy flesh. <laughs> and that part has blossomed into a manifestation of a corporate anointing and corporate participation. Roughly like each has a psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song, but I'm not going to be doing any teaching outside of my opinions interjected here and there. Thursday, however, is totally different. Thursday is ministry only. No teaching except what is necessary to facilitate further ministry. And all of this stems out of what our call was initially many, many years ago. I shouldn't say too many years ago, just many. Uh, many, many, <laughs> sounds bad. Many years ago, uh, Full stature was the word the Lord God gave me as far as our ministry. Full stature is maturity. It's moving, as John would say in his gospel, from the child to the young man to the fathers. And that uh, today's message is on fathers and mentoring and the relationship that you have with God. Keeping in mind that most of the breakthrough we saw in people's lives, and I'm talking, when we say breakthrough, I'm not talking about baby Christians. I'm talking about people who have been in the faith 20, 30, 40 years, seeing major breakthroughs, because you can have the right answers in your head and lack the spiritual experience of those truths. And so uh, we started out recommending bitter roots for a lot of people because that clarified things for them. Beware, Hebrews 12, 15, beware lest any bitter root spring up in you cause you trouble and defile others. Yes, they're responsible for their own sin, but you're responsible also for recognizing that you're part of the problem. All right? Bitter roots do that, but the uh, essentially the bottom line of a bitter root in Hebrews 12, uh, verse 15, is that uh, bitter roots are how you see God or fail to see God. And that is so important that no matter how long you've been in the faith, no matter how much Bible knowledge you have in your head, the fact of the matter is your perception toward life is if it's not, if it's not been revealed by God himself and you're in agreement with what the word says about you and what you say about the word, there's, there's bitter roots. There's a judgment. 
on something. And so before I even begin the message, uh, this is for the benefit of the people that are coming. Uh, these things need to be uh, looked into, especially Jennifer's message, because uh, people have come here from all over the, uh, the world and have signed up on our online school if they're out of the country. And they all said, I was a Christian for 40 years. Here's somebody telling us how to do what I already knew I was supposed to do. And the other statement was that it's like learning a new language, you know? How many felt like when you came here, you were, you were, you were, we cater to the mature who are pressing into maturity, all right? And a baby Christian in that atmosphere, it's like uh, my son Jason said, uh, he got off track and he come back to the Lord. He said, being around healthy people will make all the difference in the world. Like if you're a former drug addict and you're still hanging around with your drug addict buddies, it's not likely you're going to make much progress, okay? Uh, so, but uh, there's spiritual laws. And I watched Jennifer do this, uh, not just amongst mature Christians about bitter roots, but I saw her do it. Uh, I was a guest speaker at, uh, when she was a school psychologist. She had uh, the BEH class. That was the ones the teachers could not handle. Guess what they did? This is really a great system. They put them all in one room. And it's a Jennifer, here, here's your class. All the ones the teachers couldn't handle, we put them in one room, and they did them bouncing off. But Jennifer gave the basics of bitter roots, and many of them, the vast majority were unsaved, obviously. But she said, there's some laws. You don't have to like the law, but it's, it's there. It's like gravity. She held a pen and dropped it in that classroom. What was the average age? About 13, 15, 13-ish. She dropped the pen and she said, that's a law called gravity and you don't have to believe in it. You don't have to like it, but it's going to operate. And she gave them, uh, well, really, uh, those that have studied the bitter roots, we know there's five major laws. But the one that cannot be denied and God will not be mocked is what you sow, you reap. And the only way to stop the reaping of what you sowed is the work of the cross. And it needs to be applied through repentance and forgiveness. But not repentance and forgiveness that's in the head. There needs to be a transaction in the, in the, in the gut. When the transaction changes to peace, just like asking Jesus to come into your heart, when it changes to peace, there's been a transaction. Most people just say the right words, say the right thing, and then wonder why their Christianity is, is not working because it works, it really works. And we've had testimonies from all over the world. And what was interesting is when I first got saved, I told Jennifer, uh, I had uh, I messed with drugs and all that other stuff, and so I thought my ministry was gonna be, be drugs and alcohol, and I visited the uh, uh, halfway houses where people were out of prison, and, and it was all fun and everything, and Sid even put one of those reenactments of when I was working at a halfway house where a guy pulls a knife. But anyway, make a long story short, um, the plan that God had was he started sending me eye surgeons, lawyers. He sent me uh, a young Harvard engineer who was working where my dad was working. He said he was doing 10 people's jobs. That's, I said, that's kind of an overstatement. He said, no, it's not. And I mentored him, and God was teaching me something. And then he also taught me that the very things that I was teaching them was spiritual application to where they needed the corroboration for their theology. It's nice to know it. you got to start somewhere. You better have a Bible base. But on the other hand, if you haven't experienced it, it's just theory. And taught brilliant people how to get out of their head and expect a supernatural exchange. Expect a supernatural transaction to take place in the reading of the word and in the living it out in everyday life. And they, they, they did so well and they grew so quickly. And then God turned the table and he gave us little children, four years old. And they were getting results from Jesus, age four. I'm saying, doesn't that sound a little bit more like Jesus and counseling or therapy? 
wouldn't Jesus minister, be able to minister to a Rhodes Scholar and a four-year-old? If your system is too complicated for a four-year-old, perhaps you have to return back to the simplicity that's in just Jesus. But it needs to be real, not some kind of a, a phrase. And so the five rules of relationship, and this is what we want to cover today. The five rules is sowing and reaping isn't going to go away. God's not mocked. What you sow, you reap. And the only way to stop that reaping is repentance and forgiveness. And it cleanses you. And when there's a transaction, that transaction remains with you the rest of your life. That's sanctification or that area in your life. When you repent or receive forgiveness for something, when it's done from the heart, Matthew 18, forgive from the heart, not the head. People that forgive from the head struggle with forgiveness. Years. When I married Jennifer, she was trying to forgive somebody for what, two years? I'm going, that if you're struggling with it, you're trying to do something only God can do. Only God can forgive sin, and yet he says, unless you forgive. So the only way true forgiveness can take place is it has to be a joint effort from the new creation you, from your spirit, to where it's you and God doing it. I watched pastors argue over the word you, and they, they were both right. It was what they meant by you. Apart from him, you can do nothing. That you is independent of the spirit of God within. Dead works, anything else, get frustrated, want to quit, drop out. Then there's the, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And really the revelation when we travel church to church, the thing that broke through the fastest for people was, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to perform according to his good pleasure. And we had an adjunct professor from Yale who was, was looking at editing our first book on practicing the presence of God. And she, and she came up with this, and we've used it ever since. She said, actually, you could say, Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I, independent I, who lives, but Christ who lives within me suggesting that it is no longer I who forgive, but Christ in me who does the forgiving. It also suggests it is no longer I who love. We love because he what? First loved us. You can't give something you've never had in the spirit. So her suggestions were right. That's exactly, it has to be out of the new creation you, regardless of how much Bible knowledge you have, regardless whether you went to Bible school. Some of the most messed up people I've dealt with went to Bible school and had the right answers. The danger is I already knew that. <laughs> but did you know it intimately to where there was transformation? That's the key. So uh, anyway, these five rules, and I'm not going to spend time on these, but you need to know them. Get a Bitter Roots booklet if you need it. Sowing and reaping is the principle for one to see God clearly. You've got to understand that what you sow, you're going to reap and the need to deal with that. Secondly, I didn't like this part, being a street kid. Um, you reap more than what you sow. It's the law of increase. You sow a seed, you reap a harvest. Well, that's good and bad, isn't it? You, there's an increase. That's a law. You sow a seed, you reap a... See, I thought eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. As a street kid, if I punch somebody in the face and he punches me back, we're even. And God said, mm, in my kingdom... You punch somebody and don't deal with the anger in your heart. And you're going to get periodically punched the rest of your life when you least expect it. How do you like that reaping? And I'm going, I don't think I like that. I think I'd rather repent. Wouldn't you? All right. Then the third element, and this is key. This is the thus saith the Lord for today. And, and I know that I know. And that is that honoring and dishonoring parents. This sounds, that sounds so not important, but Deuteronomy 5.16, honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, that your days may be long and that life may go well with you. And to the degree, this is my part, to the degree you do not honor mother and father, life does not go well and it will be the way you see God. If you still see God in reality, relationally, as the way you see your mother or father, you've got a ways to go because you've got a bitter root 
and it's clogging the lens of your perception about God. Now, the beautiful part about that is that my father was illegitimate and was rejected by my grandfather. He had other sisters and brothers, and my grandfather, when it came to my dad, was invisible. And he knew a level of rejection that was unbelievable. He was my grandfather's embarrassment. And he was Canadian. They even snuck him across the border. They didn't want to pay the $5 head tax. They hid him under a blanket. <laughs> but uh, my dad grew up with that being invisible. I was born, and guess what? I had two sisters younger. My dad saw them and just loved them, and I was invisible. He wasn't doing that on purpose. This is the response that he carried down from my grandfather. And what was interesting is, you know, you can sit there and, and complain and, and, and curse and wish that he would pay attention to you and quit being invisible. And after all, I have a right to be acknowledged, even to the point that uh, I think it was pri just prior to being a Christian, I can remember my dad uh, saying one of the first things I had to pray through as a Christian was my dad was saying one of my sisters, younger sisters, had got spinal meningitis, and they were afraid she could die. And my dad was crying in there. This is for my two sisters. He was crying, and he said, why couldn't it have been him? How would you think that would make you feel? But you know what God taught me? God says, you get your affirmation from me, not your father. And all of a sudden, what I began to see was that I am what I am by the grace of God, and I like me. Because it was more from the new creation reality than my father's perception. And you know what that did? I learned, I released forgiveness to my dad. Released demands and expectations. You'd be surprised how many people are still living with demands and expectations on people who are already dead. You know, they don't even see the irrational, but they're demanding something. I'm saying, my people have committed two evils, Jeremiah. They've, they've forsaken me, the fountain, the source, and they've found substitutes. And trust me, if you live in that level of rejection, you found substitutes. There's no void in your life. You found a substitute. There's something filling that in your life. But... The beauty was after I was a young pastor for maybe three or four years in, in, in my first church, uh, I was talking about some of these things. And I looked up, I had an altar call, and I looked up and there's my dad with tears pouring down his face. He had never heard an affirming word through a male voice. Never heard an affirming word through a male voice. So isn't it good that I didn't hold that bitter root against him and says, it, this, these bitter root things, these things that are even generational, I'm going to be the one that turns it around. Bitterness has never produced anything good, ever. And, and uh, the honoring and dishonoring parents to the degree you dishonor them, and you say, but you don't know what I was raised with. Well, you don't know what I was raised with either, but the point is, Honor does not mean honor their bad behavior. It means forgive them and get your perception from God in whom you're a relationship with. Because you're going to see God as one who's distant, rejecting. And until that changes, it won't change until you forgive them and release the demands and expectations. Okay, next, judging. Judge not lest you be judged. For with the judgment you use, it will be measured back to you. You who judge. Now, we all hear about judging and receiving. But the measure you use, judging means condemning, writing off. It's not making, uh, as we talked about Tuesday night, it's not making an assessment or an appraisal. You have to do that all day long. You've got to make judgments all day. I know it's real culturally relevant right now where it's cool for young people to say, don't judge me, you know which means you have to agree with every goofy thing I do or we can't be pals, <laughs> you know. Uh, it's don't judge me, 
it's like you probably already know you're doing something wrong when you even say that. You probably, if your conscience has any life to it at all, all right? So what you judge others for, you yourself will do the same. And then in this BEH class, uh, all these toughies, especially the guys, they were in a little guy gang, uh, Kevin, uh, said that, where are you going to be in a few years from now? He said, I'll probably be with my friends either dead or in prison. And Kevin uh, and Jennifer says, well, you know, your name means kindness. She got their, what their names mean from the Bible store. It's a secular high school, I mean, middle school. And that's not me. And Jennifer started milking it. I mean, she's so, so you got to watch her. She goes, you mean in your entire life, Kevin? You never did an act of kindness ever. Suddenly, kindness is just pouring out of him. Oh, I helped the guy fix a flat tire. He didn't know, and I did this. this, this. But bottom, bottom line, when it came to bitter roots, the part where one of them freaked out, I don't know if that was Kevin or not, but it was one of the other boys, was, boys, the things you judge your father for, you will do the same thing. It's a law. You don't have to like it, but unless you resolve it, you who judge will do the same thing. Boys, the things you judge your fathers for, you will do the same thing. Boys, the thing you judge your mothers for, you will reap someday through a wife. Girls, the things you judge your father for, someday you'll reap it through a husband. I'll tell you, sowing and reaping is not something to be considered lightly. I say resolve those issues in your heart. Get rid of any bitter root, because it will only cause you trouble and defile. You can actually push somebody to sin against you. Do you know that? That's what it means to defile. They're responsible for their own sin, but I don't want to be the one who's pushing them till they sin against me. Now, you who judge, you will do the same thing. He freaked out. He went and said, Jennifer, is what you're saying true? I hate my father. I do not want to be like my father. And you're saying, it's a law and I have to be. You who judge, you will do the same thing. Actually, you're probably acting like them right now. All, all these hardcore cases at the end of the day. Yeah, he, at the end of the day when there's nobody looking, because you can't put all these kids in one room and have them soften. That would appear as weakness. He went up to Jennifer in the hall. You had several come up to you in the hall. Mrs. Clark. I need to make a private appointment. I got some people I need to forgive. <laughs> so it can be all ages, all backgrounds, road scholars, children, BEH classes. It really God is not a respecter of persons. Whosoever will. But it requires a, a yielding and a submitting. So, okay. That was supposed to not even be an introduction. <laughs> Oh my goodness, how much time do I have left? <laughs> At the last minute, I said, Jennifer, just put this down on my front page. You know, I probably won't use it. But anyway, spiritual fathers, sons and daughters, I really believe that God's in a season like this. Uh, our entire ministry was based from God, was, and it was a struggle at first. In my first church, we had about 250 people but the coming, the coming and the going, uh, even uh, uh, Glenn back there used to say, is this going to be another tomatoes belong in tomato patches and potatoes in potato patches? And if you're in a tomato patch and you're a potato, go, go somewhere else. <laughs> because, but it was really finding where you belong, finding where you connect, finding where home is and you feel safe. And the two things that we teach that, thin out a group, whether it's 250 or 50, we'll thin them out, will be deal with your issues and die to your agendas. If uh, people really want to mature in the Lord and they want to build relationship, most people are more comfortable in a crowd than they, than they are relationally. That takes time. And it takes, it takes what we want to talk about today, spiritual uh, fathers and, and mentors and sons and daughters. What, what does that really look like? Well, I figure I got to talk about this now because it's actually happening. People that I've 
uh, a father that have found, uh, followed our material far greater than the number we have in this room uh, from other states are suddenly coming for um, doing road trips and, and coming to get some ministry. That, but they already know a lot of this already. So they're reproducing reproducers. And that's what Full Stature was about, to raise up mature mothers and fathers. Because uh, it is more comfortable to be a child forever. I speak to you, little children, why? Because your sins are forgiven and it's all about me. What's in it for me? They even market to that. What's in it for me? Rather than, what does God require? Actually, God requires you to grow up. And by reason of use, have your senses exercised. That's Tuesday night. Having your senses exercised to discern good and evil. By reason of time, you ought to be teachers, but you still need milk. Well, where do you develop milk? Daily discernment. And the milk is what the training was done on Tuesdays, and it's accomplished enough to where it can be modeled to other people. I'm very proud of our people. Now, the um, young men... Actually, I see people my age that are still young men in ministry, on TV, wherever, all right? Because you can get stuck there. And that is, young men are, I speak to you, young men, because the Word of God abides in you strong, and you've overcome the wicked one. Those are people that got victory in their life. Victory in their life can put you on a stage, in many cases, in the marketplace or in church. But the emphasis will be on what I can do. Is that bad? No. Hopefully they learn to do something, right? But it shouldn't end with, watch what I can do. And so, like, even what we're teaching goes against that grain because it's not, Dennis, uh, you have to come to Dennis to learn to do this. We've got a whole church full of trained people that can do the same thing that I do. And not only that, we don't teach you to come back to us over and over and over again. We kick you out, no. <laughs> we tell you, we tell you, go help somebody else. Huh? It's like we do the way they train surgeons and some say they train nurses the same way. See one, do one, teach one. That's gonna pull the gold out of you. That's not just you being an audience and listening to more head knowledge, all right? So we, we know the scriptures are saying it, but it's actually happening right now too. So not that it hasn't happened in previous years, but there seems to be a trend in it. So I feel like this needs a, a refresher. So uh, spiritual fathers, uh, and this, is, this applies for you fathers who have children to be mature. You know, train up a child in the way it should go that presupposes that person's spiritually mature and emotionally stable enough to do so. Now, Isaiah 60 says, Lift up your eyes and see, they all gather, they come. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters at your side. Then you will see them become radiant and your heart's going to swell with joy. Well, my heart swells with joy when I see what I would call my spiritual sons and daughters helping other people. Moving from the child to the young man is watch what I can do. Mothers and fathers have more of a thrill seeing their children accomplish something than they themselves. That's full stature. I would rather see my kids playing on the swings. They're a little too old for that right now. But I would rather see my kids play on the swings than me go play on the swings and show you how high I can swing. Can you see the difference? There's nothing wrong with that. There are stages. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. And, and, and yeah, right now you're just discovering the beauty of being forgiven and being loved by God. And it's all about you and God's love for you. The Father's love that was a ministry that burst it over. It was still for the children. The Father's love. I need that. It's about me. The child and the young man is... We're going to teach you to do something. We're going to pay attention to your strengths and pay attention to your weaknesses. And it's actually a process of, uh, actually, spiritual fathers, if you're going to be mature at the father level, I speak to you fathers, you've known him who was from the beginning, you're going to need to understand that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. 
Your carnal ideas aren't going to raise your family and they're not going to mature anybody. Your systems, your procedures, your programs aren't going to do it. It's going to be real relationship. The second thing it's going to do is you're supposed to be a wise master builder in your household. And if you try to lay a foundation other than Jesus, you are, you are actually working against the plan of God for your life and for your family. Fathers, you're to know your spiritual tools. The message says they're ready and at hand. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal. Carnal won't work. Secondly, God says, I want you all to be wise master builders, but to be a wise master builder, you start with a proper foundation. You can't skip the foundation of intimacy with God. And thirdly, the true emphasis is that you're committed to sons and daughters. You will be there for them as best you can. But at the same time, we've got to understand something. Um, in Spiritual Fathers, now we, we talk a lot, and we've got a book on, on the, uh, the ancient blueprint where the Gentiles were coming to Jesus. They had no Old Testament background. What did the apostles of Jesus, the 12 apostles, do to teach clueless people? <clears throat> These Gentiles were clueless. They had ten gods. If, the, if their mother didn't want a baby girl, they just left it out in the cold to die. I mean, that, their value system was not the Ten Commandments. They didn't have a Ten Commandments. Those were Jewish people that had Ten Commandments. All right? So what we saw was that in the beginning, they started training them with what uh, we call the Didache. Didache was like an outline teaching tool to keep you in the apostles' teachings before we even had a New Testament. So it was based on Old Testament and what the apostles, the 12 original, actually heard through the ears of Jesus. And people stayed in the apostles' teaching. It's in the book of Acts, you can find that, where you see in reference, that was the Didache, the teachings of the apostles is the other title for the Didache. Now, in the Didache, here's, here's what they did. Picture, clueless people, I'm starting from scratch, what do I do? And it says, according to the mentor-child principle, we should honor our spiritual father even more than a natural father. Now picture Gentiles and what they meant by that. They weren't teaching them to dishonor them. They were simply saying, because, and this is according to the rabbinic tradition uh, of the Mishnah, uh, it's a notion of spiritual father. Um, for his father brought him into this world, but his mentor who taught him wisdom will bring him into the life of the world to come. You, anybody can father a child, but it's a whole nother ball game to teach them how to live in this world. Now, the Didache opens with that. And I noticed, I don't know exactly how long the Didache took. Jennifer thinks sometimes one to three years. It's hard to tell. But all I know is by lesson three in the Didache, something changed in the terminology. It changed to my child. Somewhere there was a, an apparent willingness to be teachable to the mentor. I don't believe everybody was. Once they saw the cost, they saw people being martyred for the cause of Jesus. But it says in, in the third chapter of the Didache, the student is not just a seeker now, but a beloved child with a spiritual parent. When the Didache used the expression, my child, my children, it taps into the rich culture of discipleship within the Jewish tradition. Learning to be a disciple by becoming an apprentice was considered to be a holy endeavor that brought mentor and student into the divine presence of God. It was a, called a holy endeavor because it involved God, the mentor, and the student. And now it makes even, uh, if you've watched The Chosen, if you saw any of the, the way they went to get a disciple, to be mentored by someone. And Jesus did it. Now, here's the part I want to get to. I'm, going, I'm moving along quickly now. <laughs> One time I told Jennifer we were, we, were, we were being taped, and the time was running out, and I'm going like this. And she interpreted that as talk faster. So, <laughs> so I guess I'll just talk faster. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, this is why 
it's a work together and everything we teach is taking all of your biblical knowledge and applying like a Philippians 2.13 for it is God who is at work in you to will and to perform if you implemented that concept it would be you and God and you would be in a healthy environment to bounce things off of healthy people instead of, I don't know I don't go to a, a, a depressed person for advice do you? Pray for me. I know you're under it, and I know you're borderline suicidal, but would you please pray for me? You know, you wouldn't do that. Instead, you should be looking for a redemptive solution for them. All right? Redemption is the name of the game. So anyway, the one thing that is worth mentioning here is that uh, there is an exception to discipleship, and that's where we see, always have seen people come and go. The, the emphasis, lots can't be mentored. Uh, if you look in the scripture, Moses worked with Joshua. Joshua was a detemperament. That means he was a natural mover, shaker, leader. And how did God frame him and prepare him for real ministry? He put him under Moses. Take a top doggy who's got their own ideas, they want to be boss, and put him under somebody. It will pull the gold out or the bitterness, one of the two. And I believe Joshua was trained by being under someone and, and honoring them. Moses, Joshua. Elijah had Elisha. Jesus had disciples. Paul had and bragged on my son Timothy. Okay? Now, but just to make a, a, a quick mention of that, though, is lots can't be mentored. And why not? Because one, it was uh, Abram took Lot with him which may have been a mistake, but they were both rich in livestock. There was strife. Now, why do you suppose there would be strife? It says the flocks and the herds, he had plenty of them of his own. The land was not able to support both of them. And I like the fatherly aspect of Abraham. Well, they call him Father Abraham, so I guess he would have some fatherly aspect. All right. But it says, he says, it was not able to support them that they could dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Abram said to Lot, please, let there be no strife. That's love. Hmm? It's not about, I'm going to win. You know, D temperaments have a tendency to interpret all of life by win-lose, win-lose. We used to do that with Allison. Is that Allison? If you ask your mother a question with that push that's coming from you, the answer is automatically no. <sighs> She'd relax. <laughs> and if you push, the answer will automatically be no because they, she's coming from a win-lose. She's 13 years old. Denny, can I drive? And I'm going, no, you're 13. Allison, you got a genius IQ. Why would you, it was like, for me, it was amazing she had no common sense. <laughs> it was like, you're a brilliant girl, but why would you ask? And she had a good answer. What if? What if I didn't ask and you would have said yes? There you have it. Okay. So whatever. But anyway, there was strife. And Abram said there's a need to separate. And even in the separation, he goes, go your way. I'm not trying to control you. Please, separate from me. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. That's a release that is as healthy as one can get. There's no demands or expectations. There's no win-lose. There's no antagonism there. It's basically, he was acting more like the father. Lot was acting more like the spoiled child who had to have what he wanted to have, and he had to have it now. Or there'd be strife. A father can't change Lot. Lot chose for himself. So there will always be people that choose for themselves. Now, here's where I want to go with it. Here's what we're doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, Thursdays mostly ministry, but this still has to be in the atmosphere. And this is what we want to continue to have. Our church can model it now because we've got maturity there. And it's mothering and fathering, both. And I love this. Uh, you say, where's that in the scripture? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. 
For though you might have 10,000 instructors, yet you do not have many fathers. One translation even says, though you have 10,000 boy leaders. I always worried about Bible schools, even church-run Bible schools that had young people raising young people. I'm going to, there's got to be a little bit of input from somebody a little bit more mature, you know. Otherwise, it becomes more like gang mentality, you know. That's like a, a fake family in the city. The gangs were a fake family. And, but guess who the boss was? Somebody your age. He would just have to be more intimidating than the other ones. And the pecking order would be who's more intimidating. Now, a little bit of Chicago still comes out of me every now and then. But there's things you learn on the street that really need to be remedied in the kingdom. And one of the things that needs to be remedied in the kingdom is, you're not going to like this, but in the, in, in the street, fear is the prevailing demonic atmosphere. And it works. It works in politics. It works on the street. It works everywhere. People are suckers for fear. They drink it in. But in the kingdom, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And righteousness is love and action. The kingdom of God is all emotional, and it's all the fruit of the Spirit. How much fruit of the Spirit's in your life? Check your Christianity out, really. Maturity would require that you walk in peace most of the time. Peace is love resting. Peace is love ruling. Let the peace of God rule. The God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. It is by no means passive. It's powerful. No. Here's, here's the part we're dealing with today, and I've got time to cover this the way I wanted it to. Um, he says, you don't have many fathers, but then he also says, my little children, just like the rabbinic teachers, mentors did, my little children from whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warp philosophies, tearing down Barriers that are erected. That was Jennifer's message last week and really needs to be looked at again. Fitting every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure of a life shaped by Jesus. Now, mothering. And this full stature is the aim is to make or cultivate mature mothers and fathers. Not baby food, not milk, meat. And to get meat... It comes by having your senses exercised to discern real spirituality, not hype. I mean, I've met a lot of prophetic people who their discernment was not very sharp at all. Discernment has to distinguish this is flesh, this is spirit. You could be very gifted and not be discerning. So discerning is to differentiate. This is flesh, this is spirit. Now, here it is, mothering. It's Monday morning. Mom gets the kids out of bed, feeds them a nutritious breakfast, reminds them to gather up their books and homework, and get them to school on time. Is that a good thing? Yeah, that's mothering. And it's an absolute prerequisite. I've never been able to father someone who wasn't properly mothered. Because they're afraid. They keep their distance. They put up walls. You walk in, you meet them for the first time, and down here... By discerning the human spirit, first thing you feel is this. Hi, how are you? The words can be polite, and but in here they're guarded. That's a carnal weapon. That's a carnal protection. That's self-protection as opposed to God protection. God protection is peace will guard your heart and your mind. But you don't have enough confidence in the peace, so you put up a flesh wall. That doesn't work anyway. Now, without mothering... In place first, the child really will not learn. Wow, we really need that then, don't we? Mothers provided an atmosphere of love, safety, and security. So whether you're a male, female, whatever, God had always planned for that reparenting of the church. Especially those Gentiles. And it doesn't matter whether you had good parents or bad parents. Remember, you honor them, and then you find out what God requirement is for you. You don't honor their bad behavior, but you don't dishonor them by failing to forgive them, because then you're trapped. 
Now, without mothering, the child won't learn. It takes a mothering approach, whether it's a male or a female, could be a school teacher, who creates an environment of rested, fed, well-resourced child to go to school, male or female. But after mothering has reached high tide, it still requires fathering, whether by a male or a female, to create the pressure to unpack, that's a good word, unpack the potential within the child. That's fathering. Unpacking the potential. Everybody needs to feel safe and secure, but at some point, you need to mature past feeling safe and secure. In that environment, you stand a better chance of being unpacked and becoming all that God called you to be and to do all that he called you to do. Now, pressure is what, what it's all about. After mothering has reached high tide, it still requires the fathering, whether by male or female, to create the pressure. This is where you either fight or flight. <laughs> you feel the pressure that unpacks the potential within the child. We have team, online school for that purpose. We've got the 60-day challenge named after Jennifer. We've got the peace challenge. We've got self-deliverance. And you know what all of this emphasizes? Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry instead of coming to the expert. And let's see if we can wear out the expert. Or what Bob Jones say, 10% of the best of the best healing evangelists have 10% results. I want to equip the 90%, how to remove the barriers to be more available for the work of God instead of sovereignly waiting for God to do something through somebody, Joe Heavy Speaker. Where, where is it in the scripture where it says, go and make converts? It says, go and make disciples. And you're responsible in your family as well as in the church. Now, this pressure is like boot camp situation. Generally, children do not like pressure from the fathering component. <laughs> that fathering component gives tests and quiz and homework. What child is going to say, oh, I am thrilled. I was given homework over the weekend. Generally, they don't. Mothering is a type of womb. Uh, the environment was pretty special. When the child was in the womb, it grew pretty naturally without any effort. We like it that way. No effort. That's the way we saw when we were going from church to church. We had so many hundreds of people that wanted ministry. We had to sort through. You know who we sort through with? Whoever did the little bit baby homework we gave, we would minister to. Because there were just too many. If you, couldn't, if you were too busy to do the little homework, you weren't serious enough. I'm going to go find someone that's serious. Effort played a key role into spiritual change. And we saw plenty of quality change. One lady had to get a babysitter, get on a ferry in New, uh, off the coast of Connecticut, get on a ferry boat, drive two and a half hours to the meeting. She walked in and power God eliminated stuff that she struggled with her whole life in one session. But there was some effort there, wasn't it? She had to arrange a babysitter. She had to get on a ferry boat to take her to the, to the mainland. She, she had to drive two and a half hours to get ministry. Those are the kind of people that get results. Now, the body did not come to the point of excellence in the womb. The soul. The child really does not develop much cognitively, emotionally, or even making good choices in the womb. <laughs> I just, leave me alone. I like this. <laughs> I'm secure. I'm comfortable. Jesus mothered his disciples to a point until high tide. It says they were with him day and night. He had endless conversations with them, some of which is, have I got to be with you forever? <laughs> but it was, I think it was reaching high tide about that point, right? Don't you think? And then the, he, they were with him day and night. He encouraged them. He reassured them. Fathering example, 
At school, a teacher communicates ideas and designs a series of activities to help the student develop competency. In the home, dad leads by being a good example, providing proper discipline, and takes his children camping to teach them skills of setting up a tent, starting a campfire. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know about the starting a campfire. <laughs> I'd wait till a little bit older. But anyway, <laughs> this fathering approach, though, is the goal is to release or unpack the potential in the child. A seven-year-old has the ability to learn how to read, but no amount of good environment automatically causes reading to happen. The potential in the child is only unpacked by some strategic pressure from outside. And generally, the children do not like pressure from the fathering component in their society. Mothering has to precede fathering, but fathering has to follow mothering. The Coast Guard, they say the Coast Guard boot camp is easy compared to the Marine boot camp. But in that case, the Marines have more potential released. So it's all in how you want to look at it. I can remember being in boot camp and just feeling good that I could do this. Because they were having you do stuff you didn't know if you could do. But afterwards, it, it, it feels really good to say, I, was, I did it. I heard people committing suicide and couldn't take it and having meltdowns and crack ups and and it's like I can do this. And and it was it was really the fathering. Matter of fact, my sergeant said, Smokey Bear hat, and he'd come up and go, I, I mean, it had to have been from New Jersey somewhere, I don't know, but I'm your mother and I'm your father. You don't have a mother or a father, I'm your mother and your father today. <laughs> Look at me. You see this face? You're mine. I'm going, oh, no. Can I leave home? <laughs> but Jesus fathered. Now, when did Jesus switch it? After high tide of spending all this time with them, wondering how long he's going to be with them. He goes, he equipped them and sent them out on their own. Whoa. And he expected them to draw on what was inside of them, not from him or some safety net. He that has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit's saying. Huh? Well, now, almost everybody in our little church can do the phone ministry from people around the country and around the world. You're mothering and you're fathering more than you know. You're reproducing according to kind, which was God's original intent in Genesis. You are predestined to reproduce according to kind. Now, here's some qualities for mothering. It focuses on equality. Everybody's treated the same. That's a mothering concept. You're all loved, you're all accepted, and you're all forgiven. That's the child. It focuses on immediate caregiving. Oh, oh honey, you hurt yourself. Oh, let me, let me. Let me hug you. It'll be, oh, you feel better now? Okay. Let me put a Band-Aid on that. All right. You believe the myth that life must be kind and gentle with many resources. I can still see uh, Emmy's little attitude when she went to Carowinds and she was too short to get on the ride. She went. They said, oh, I'm sorry, honey, you can't. You're not tall enough. Why? Why? That's still the child, right? <laughs> Why? Why is life not easy? Why? I, I'm in the right environment. Why? I'm special. <laughs> Don't let me start on that one. They feel they're special without achievement or character development, simply because they are. I don't have to achieve anything. I don't need to be unpacked. I don't need to be fathered. I am special. I should just be given everything. I'm entitled. Believe that they are automatically entitled just because I'm alive. <laughs> now, is there an extent where that's good in the process? Yeah, feeling safe and secure. But if you're safe and secure, then you're prepared for the fathering potential, which is focused on differentiation and achievement 
and children excel at different things and fail at other things and you're to be there for them fail but don't be a failure it's the way you learn to achieve something you try it again you fall down in the Bible uh, Micah 7 is a good example when I fall I will arise all right it's like fall down get back up don't wallow in it learn from it I sat with pastors most of my Christian life that were all older than me all, all of which are with the Lord now but on a weekly basis sitting with them you glean you glean a whole lot that kept me from making those same mistakes because they all said well I did this wrong and I did that wrong and then you said I don't think I want to do that but I had to be around healthy people you need to be in a church around healthy people more than a crowd and more than someone who just gives you lip service to the relationship you want someone that's open to the reality of what God put together in your life and that goes outside of the local church that goes into the home that goes into your relationships your friends your neighbors whatever now here's a story about Aiken I don't remember how the story went but I had it in my notes years ago uh, he came from Africa and he's going coming to America and uh, Aiken's story is when when coming to America he said where should I go to church and his mentor at that time in Africa said don't find a church find the spiritual father he gave him the fact that the maturing requirements requ maturing requires fathering whether we like it or not mothering alone is not enough receiving information alone is passive mothering you can sit in church and learn and learn and learn and learn for your head but that's passive mothering knowing who we are is not the same as unpacking who we are big difference fathering gives you the opportunity and the pressure to unpack who you are it, it, it requires more than just listening to a sermon if you are applying what we're teaching here and I know the vast majority are you will have testimonies wiggle out of that one we have people who have come here because they saw the change in somebody else. That's a testimony. That's better than head knowledge of Christianity. A testimony is why Women's Aglow and Full Gospel Businessmen has great results with shaping men and women was because the person talking actually had an internal transformation on that truth, not just that's the right thing to do because I know it's in the Bible. Ink on the page is a as as opposed to a supernatural transaction now I'm going to be closing with this but I want to reiterate you know if you're planning on coming to get ministry yeah. Sunday's great for the preparation of the things that are happening and in, in, in the message that we're given on the other hand Tuesdays is to be trained and have your spiritual senses exercised and trust me Hebrews tells you you need by reason of use you don't use it you're not very well trained in it I don't care how long you've been in the church Thursday it's all ministry but you will learn more from watching people get ministry than you'll learn out of reading a book and you can get a lot out of a book We've got people that are reproducing our material all over the world from the book. But it's still interesting, and, and Jason has contacted many of them on the school. We've got, I don't know, probably 3,000 on the online school, and many of them have gone through all of the course. I've had people come to the church that never went through any of the modules, never did the 60-day challenge. 60 days too long. Jennifer's mentor was a Bible school president, a school psychologist, a missionary. And in less than 60 days, what happened to you? You are changed. Before we got married, her mentor, this Bible school president, school psychologist, Christian counselor, she said, I know you guys are serious, and Jennifer's a brilliant young lady, but I just want to warn you, she's pretty emotionally damaged. She may never amount to much. I saw success as a baby Christian with people who are willing to change. And that's where we need to go. 
So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we are, we are preparing a people who are not a people, but we're preparing a people to go and make disciples and to train up the child in a way he shall go so he, when he grows old, he won't depart. And we thank you for that. Jesus. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.